So welcome everybody who's joining us today. It's lovely to have you with us. Um, for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Jan Shorrock and I am the Executive Officer for, for Give a Kidney. Um, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the charity, we our primary remit is to raise awareness of non-directed living kidney donation um, and to support those going through the process. Um, so today we are very lucky to be joined by um, three uh, wonderful speakers um, who I will introduce shortly um, and uh, would like to really thank them for giving up their Saturday morning to be to be with us today and we hope you find this 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 really interesting. Um, there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions using the chat facility. Um, so uh, for those of you who are on a, um, a laptop, um, usually it's towards the bottom and it's a, a button called chat. You just press that and you'll be able to en enter questions or comments for the panel. Um, and we'll try to pick those up towards the end of the session. We'll kind of have a discussion. Um, and we'll uh, offer some of those questions to the panel then. If they're aimed at a specific person, please just, just say who it's aimed at. And you can choose to remain anonymous um, through that. Um, you won't be seen on screen um, and your name will only show if, if you choose, choose it to. So that, that's at your, at your discretion. Um, we are recording today's session. Um, so the link will be available uh, afterwards, we hope, all being well. Um, and we'll be sharing that through our social media and on our website. So if uh, after today you want to relook at it, please do, or feel free to share it with anybody who maybe couldn't be here today, but you think might be interested. Um, so just for those of you um, who might be unfamiliar with the terminology, today we're talking about the challenges of directed altruistic donations. I'm just gonna really briefly run through um, the different types of living donation for those of you who might not be familiar because there are some nuances. Um, so obviously there's deceased donation, which is when organs are donated after somebody has died, that's really clear. Um, living donation falls into three kind of different discrete categories. Um, so the first one is directed donation, and that's the most common type of living donation. And that's when somebody uh, steps forward to donate uh, an organ, a kidney or a piece of their liver to um, a specific person with whom they have an existing relationship. So a friend or family member. Um, so it's going to that specific person. Um, and then the area that Give a Kidney most deals with is, is non-directed living donation. Um, so that's when somebody steps forward to donate a kidney to anonymously to somebody uh, on, the mail, on, on the mailing list, on the waiting list, um, who they don't know and probably will never know. So it will just go to the best match person on, on, on the waiting list. Um, and then directed altruistic donation is a kind of nuanced version of that. So again, it's um, somebody who is donating to somebody specific, but with whom they didn't have a prior existing emotional relationship. So um, this might be commonly through a campaign on social media um, where somebody's appealed for a kidney for, for themselves or a family member and somebody who doesn't know that person has that's resonated with them and they've stepped forward with the intention of donating to that specific person and it has you know slightly different challenges to um, other forms of living donation and that's what we're going to be exploring today. Um, so I hope that's clear if, if not please uh, speakers um, add, add any nuances to that as well as, as we go through. Um, and if you've got any questions on that, please just use the chat function. We'll try to pick those up as we go through through today. Um, so the first speaker today is um, transplant surgeon Frank Thor, who is a transplant surgeon at Hammersmith. Um, and he's going to talk, he might want to introduce himself further, and he's going to talk about um, the challenges of directed altruistic donation um, for the transplant community in particular. So welcome, Frank, and I'll hand you over right now. Thank you. Thank you, Jan. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here. Um, we planned this for a long time ago. I think this was just the beginning of the first uh, uh, lockdown in uh, more than a year ago. So it's really here, really great to be here and that we can actually do this. I'll start sharing my screen, which is always the best part of any presentation, especially because they seem to always disappear. 
And there we go. So thank you so much uh, for the invite. Um, and it's really a pleasure to uh, join this exciting webinar. And I was asked to, to speak specifically about ethical challenges uh, of directed altruistic living kidney donation. I think we'll also address uh, lots of practicalities and um, donor and patient factors, but I hope to bring that uh, together to something uh, um, useful. So as a disclosure, I'm not not an ethicist. I uh, try to be ethical uh, and I'm interested in ethics and I have various roles uh, within the trust and in the sector, Northwest London sector, as well as in Europe um, in relating to, to ethics. And very involved in all aspects of live donation, uh, not just the cutting and the stitching. And I am, as some of you will recognize, uh, a social media enthusiast. So when we talk about ethics, what is it to be just uh, to, to try to grasp this a bit uh, easier? I think it is like a, a moral compass. So uh, it, it's based on moral principles that govern the practice of medicine. And what are ethical principles that would, uh, would be, people would allude to in, in medical ethics to keep it really simple uh, Beauchamp and Childress have, uh, have postulated basically four main categories of uh, principles uh, for ethics. And actually, if you remember those, and I'll try to go through them uh, in a second, throughout the presentation, you will see that they all come to light in various ways. Um, so the first and probably foremost uh, ethical principle is the uh, respect of, uh, for autonomy. And this is, of course, very much alluding to the donor who wants to donate, but also towards the recipient who wants to hopefully take control over their own disease and their treatment process. Principle of non-maleficence, non um, it's, um, it's always a tongue twister. Uh, it is basically that we will, won't harm people. So we have to make sure to not harm people. And obviously with living donation, as a surgeon, we always do an operation that that particular person doesn't need for themselves, at least not for their health benefit. And then the principle of beneficence to always do the right thing for a patient. Uh, so to, to act in one's best interest. Uh, and the principle of justice uh, comes to light in various ways in uh, reciprocity, in, in, in transplantation, but also distributive justice. So basically uh, making sure that all the people have equal access to healthcare, equal access to transplant options, um, and, and also, um, well, that, that's the most important thing, I guess. I think Jan already mentioned this, uh, that's what's quite helpful, but if we talk about directed altruistic life donation, it is well-defined in the Human Tissue Authority framework in two categories, so basically people with a genetic relationship and no established emotional relationship that donate. So people that live overseas and they have been estranged from their potential recipient for many years or a relative with whom there was no contact previously at all, so a far uncle. Um, no pre-existing relationship between donor and recipient could be uh, a contact through social media um, or bespoke websites and newspapers. I'll get back to that. What is it not? It is not, as Jan was saying as well, the non-directed altruistic or unspecified donation from an anonymous donor to an anonymous, completely unrelated uh, and unknown recipient. Now, just to highlight a few advantages of live kidney donation, because uh, we need to keep saying that uh, it's an elective operation and we can plan for a recipient, uh, a transplant well in advance if the, the, the kidney disease progression is allowing for that, so that we can avoid dialysis at all. Um, and this is the only real way to, to make sure that can happen. And of course, by planning an operation, you can include the most difficult uh, cases, most difficult patients uh, during daytime rather than in the middle of the night when people are tired and the staffing is a bit less than uh, during the day. Advantages for the recipient, I mentioned the preemptive, dial uh, preemptive transplantation option, and we can uh, include uh, people for incompatible transplants, but 
more frequently in the UK, of course, to include them in the uh, live donor kidney sharing scheme that is very successful in this country, dealing with people that are um, incompatible in terms of donor recipient for various reasons, or for people that hope to get a better match. And in the end, always a deceased donor waitlist patient would benefit from such uh, chain transplants as well. Selected donors will lead to good quality kidneys. They're, those are healthy people and have been uh, you know, screened quite thoroughly. Um, and this will also result in good quality kidneys compared certainly to someone who has just died with lots of uh, comorbidities and other problems. The cold ischemia time, so the time that the kidney is outside the body, so to speak, um, is, 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 uh, is really short because the donor and recipient are normally in the same hospital or the kidney has to travel a short distance, but certainly shorter than for deceased donor transplantation. And that also leads to better graft function. We can do impossible transplants. Uh, very difficult patients uh, are better served with a live kidney donation again, because you can plan things. And economic advantages are also there. And people might not realize that one live donor kidney transplant uh, at least can save society or the NHS about 650,000 pounds in 10 years compared to dialysis. So this is an example of an impossible transplant uh, that was served by um, an, a directed altruistic uh, live kidney donor. This, gentleman in the middle in my old hospital in uh, Rotterdam in the Netherlands received a seventh kidney transplant um, and he got it from an estranged stepsister. Um, that was a, a zero, zero, zero mismatch, so a perfect matched kidney for him uh, who had previously had six uh, failed transplants and therefore was very difficult to match even through uh, the sharing scheme in the Netherlands. And he actually approached the Guinness Book of World Records to be the uh, record holder of number of transplants. So live donor kidney transplant is the preferred treatment for end-stage kidney disease patients. The recipients would rely on their social network. Still lots of people uh, think that only blood related or family members can donate. That's still, I think, a belief uh, that I come across quite often. Um, but actually you, you can have any sort of relationship. You have to be emotionally related or genetically related in order to donate. But the message we give patients is quite simple and there it stops, go and find a live kidney donor. And we don't really have a structure Well, we have educational seminars and we have webinars and we have uh, charities and we have lots of support systems, but still it's up to the individual patient uh, to discuss it in their social network. And that's very difficult for many people that don't want to talk about their disease uh, or cannot show their weakness towards family members or friends and feel that their health should never prompt someone else's health. So are we relying on altruism? Um, and what is really altruism? Is it uh, a more altruistic to donate uh, from a husband to a wife? from a brother to a sister, from a neighbor to a neighbor, for, uh, a, uh, um, for me to donate to my mother-in-law, that would be of course quite altruistic. Um, but you see, it's quite difficult, or is it only altruistic if some anonymous donor donates to uh, an anonymous recipient to them? So altruism is quite difficult because it's basically helping other people without self-benefit. Um, and there's another, uh, another definition here from August Comte from a long time ago, but um, you know, people lead a certain lifestyle uh, to act in the best interest of others. And apparently there is a particular part of the brain, the superior temporal posterior branch. If you scratch here, you actually will find out if you're altruistic or egoistic, selfish. Um, but actually there is neurological studies done with MRIs where you can see that some people are just more altruistic out of nature um, compared to others who don't find that very important to think about others all the time. So there's several degrees of altruism. Also, I think the terminology doesn't really help us because a directed altruistic live kidney donor, can we not just say we donate to someone that we uh, specify our kidney to, or we donate to someone who we don't know, and therefore it is an unspecified donation. 
I think at least um, that would clear up quite a bit of the misconceptions, but we have to deal, of course, with a regulatory framework and definitions. Um, but in my view, things could be made a bit more simple. Now, we alluded to it, I think Jan mentioned public solicitation. Basically, when we say to people, go out and find a live kidney donor, that would be the best for you. Lots of people I, either go through their social network and you know, phone people up or discuss it at a dinner table before physical distancing, um, uh, or have a Zoom uh, drinks on a Saturday night and discuss their problems. Uh, other people might be more shy or might find different ways or smarter ways uh, and use things that are more close to them, such as social media or newspaper advertisements, websites, and what have you. And some people use everything they have. So there's different degrees of social media, um, uh, there's public solicitation usage. Everywhere in the world you can find these, and these are quite old examples. It's not new. People have, this is a Dutch one saying, I need a kidney donor urgently. Uh, we need O positive, please, here's my phone number on the car. Um, and and this, uh, this is a uh, United States example and a UK example and an uh, Israel uh, example. You can find it everywhere. Another thing that comes to mind uh, with, um, with these strategies in public solicitation is are we doing a sort of a beauty contest? Is the, the, the most beautiful or the most um, appealing story, does that generate more donors? So let's do a little exercise. If she were to apply for a kidney donor, uh, would you think she would get more or less than this person here? Well, I would know the answer. Uh, or what about this guy who needs a kidney and um, uses public solicitation? or this fantastic lady here, and what about her? So you see this exercise might actually bring you to think that there might be indeed an element of beauty contest, or at least who has the most uh, appealing story. So how do we deal with all these public solicitation uh, requests uh, from people who need a transplant? We thought about this quite uh, a while ago already in the ethical, legal and psychosocial aspects of transplantation working group that is dealing with these kind of things in living donation and uh, actually try to figure out uh, the, the context and a framework by which uh, things could work. We talked about the legal context already. It's pro uh, uh, so public solicitation um, for an organ is prohibited only if it involves financial induced Spend. So uh, a reward, basically, or comparable advantages in the US and in the EU. But in practice, in North America, you've seen billboard advertisements for kidney donors, uh, for example, for a long time. In Europe, especially, I think the Northwestern countries have been slightly more conservative than the United States in, in allowing this to happen. But I think with, the, with social media that has really been booming, uh, we have seen more and more of these uh, things happening. Of course, public solicitation could target both deceased donation, but it's, it's not practical, in, certainly not in this country, uh, and also not in the EU. Um, and for living donation, this is most commonly practiced, actually. So public solicitation could involve monetary gain or altruism, and we think it should be focusing on altruism. We already said that there is a sort of a gradient scale of how public the public solicitation is. Uh, if you go out to your family, if you go out to your community, sports club, and you mention and share that with your friends that you need a kidney, uh, you go out to your church. Some churches have hundreds of people there. Uh, you go out to your school or your workplace. Um, you can use traditional media, specially designed websites and social media, as previously mentioned. So basically how public is public? Uh, does it have to do with uh, how related you are? If you appeal to family, friends, acquaintances, you might be uh, emotionally related for most of them, but also you, you can be genetically related of course with family. If you appeal to church and, and other places, uh, there's most likely uh, emotionally related matters and not so much genetically related. And via the media, obviously, yeah, you, there's a mix uh, because you will have friends uh, uh, on social media, you will have family on social media. There's people you 
I have known uh, when you were a child uh, from school or from a previous life in another country. Uh, and there's people on social media that actually you've only met through social media. And I certainly have many of those people. And I'm, I'm hoping I, uh, in the audience today, there will be uh, many of them. So basically, are they then not related? Or can we say they're you know, also emotionally related because you really have become friends? But also social media uh, lacks a certain degree of control because of course uh, it can spread like, I'm sorry to say, it can spread like a virus. Um, and it can really reach people that uh, have no direct connections with you and are six or seven degrees away from you. So will not be genetically related, will not be emotionally related. So I think that's how the degrees of the public solicitation really work. This is, I think, you know, one of the very first ones in the Netherlands who appeals on Facebook, a patient I transplanted um, uh, several years ago when I was still in Rotterdam. Uh, he needed a kidney and he needed a fifth kidney transplant, also a very highly sensitized patient, very difficult. Uh, got from the Facebook advertisement, uh, he got into the newspaper uh, because of this initiative uh, and actually you know uh, he also appealed as a, a football club supporter Feyenoord and that actually led to him getting a, a live kidney donor and he was successfully transplanted with a very good matched kidney and these people met beforehand uh, and actually wor it worked very well. Now again uh, a successful story here with this gentleman here in, in the Netherlands appealing on television and also on social media, uh, needing a kidney. And this lady had a specific website with, uh, you know, she hired um, a, a lot of um, uh, media experts and created a very professional um, advertisement comp uh, comp campaign. Both were successful in getting a transplant. Uh, this gentleman here received a transplant uh, after receiving hundreds of donor offers, and we'll go through that later, some of them were genuine, but most of them were not. Um, and um, how do you select with all these donor offers you get? So basically, um, I think one of our working group members in Alpat, uh, Greg Morlock, uh, wrote a very interesting paper with a different view that lots of people would condemn the beauty contest of public solicitation. But he took a quite different view in the Journal of Medical Ethics, if you're interested, to say, well, actually, what is wrong with this beauty contest? Uh, because it might take uh, away people off the waiting lists if they find um, a, a living donor uh, through social media or public solicitation in general. Well, let's talk a little bit about practicalities. I mentioned a church. Well, this is an example of um, uh, how an appeal in church could work. This was, um, this is not the actual church, but in the Netherlands, we had a patient who uh, did an appeal in his, he, he publicly solicited in his uh, church for a kidney donor. And actually we received 250 um, uh, people that wanted to come to uh, an, an educational seminar for living kidney donation. So we decided to organize a separate um, um, uh, a seminar for the church members that wanted to be considered as donors, just to make it easy. And in the end, again, he found uh, a kidney donor in, uh, in that group of people um, through public solicitation. But it brings certain practical challenges as well. What do you do if someone indeed comes with six, 700 uh, potential donors through social media? and present them to you as a live donor coordinator, you start with a blank sheet. And normally there's a couple of names if people are lucky already of potential donors, but how do you organize that? And who's gonna choose these uh, potential donors? Isn't that interesting and challenging? Because after several phone call and going th calls and going through all these potential donors, you might actually end up like this, completely overwhelmed and also frustrated because in terms of distributive justice, um, your workload is more than just, just that particular patient, but we want to treat all patients fairly. We want to make sure that our time as healthcare professionals is equally divided wherever possible between people, but we have to act in the interest, best interest of each person. So it is very challenging and sometimes frustrating that we might not have a system to do this. From a patient perspective, 
we investigated, and this was work from MMSC, um, uh, led by MMSC in Rotterdam, um, is that people that want to go out and do a public solicitation um, might consider what if this is my chance to save my life, my only chance perhaps. And we interviewed several people about their motives and their experiences um, of public solicitation to get a directed altruistic living kidney donor. Um, and you will see here, and I won't mention all of them, that before they started public solicitation, um, lots of people mentioned that they were a bit reluctant to ask their social network, uh, reluctant to accept a kidney from loved ones, because what if something would happen to them, they would feel guilty. Um, some people had no live donors in their and no, no spontaneous offers, people that didn't want to do it in their direct social network or family. They would, um, you know, it, it'd be very comfortable using social media. They would be encouraged by others. Why don't you put it on Facebook? Um, uh, those kind of considerations were quite often mentioned. And of course, uh, some people were um, also a bit reluctant in the beginning um, to post their vulnerability on social media websites um, and so on. And also it could be perceived as being selfish. Well, why would you have to trump other patients on that waiting list? Or why don't you uh, need a donor more urgently than others would do? But in the end, all these decisions let, all these considerations led to a decision to go ahead with public solicitation and then people shared their experiences and they were very mixed. And we can talk a bit more about it in the panel, I think, but there were positive emotions, feeling overwhelmed with so much, many lovely people that wanted to do good for them. Uh, but also they came across people who were not so genuine and wanted to take advantage of their situation and wanted money. Um, and also lots of people were insecure. Why didn't I get offers yet? Um, am I not good enough? Um, uh, is my strategy good enough? Uh, uh, how do I do in the beauty contest, so to speak? So lots of uh, very interesting experiences uh, we can't all mention here because of time. But uh, to conclude this part, and we'll get back to a bit more uh, details later. Um, so basically all the people that decided to go ahead with public solicitation was mainly driven by frustration um, of not having enough organs uh, from either living or deceased donors uh, and need for action and people feeling hopeless. Uh, public solicitation was you know, very emotional for people uh, with mixed emotions but, uh, and logistically very taxing. Uh, the expectations were quite often unrealistic because they saw someone on the television with 600 potential donors, uh, but what if it doesn't happen to you? And what is the chance and actually ending up with a transplant? So lots of people have been disappointed and felt without any guidance, basically. So there's need for improved education on this particular aspect and, and also a support system for patients who are considering this process. There's a few examples of standardized Facebook um, uh, approaches um, for facilitating living organ donation from some colleagues from Australia and uh, the States. It's a very interesting read. So you would have a standardized app with a picture and everyone had a similar app, um, uh, basically uh, to make it more equal for everyone else. So you can do that on smartphones and it's actually quite well published. So we have to make sure we can deal with public solicitation, but is it our responsibility as healthcare professionals? Is it just a patient's responsibility? Whose responsibility is it and who should guide? Uh, I think public solicitation is here to stay. It's already here and it will stay here. Um, and it will be allowed in countries uh, where this is uh, 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 legal. Um, of course, the screen procedures, we need to deal responsibly with the donor office and also the workload of the live donor coordinators need to be taken into account. Um, so that they can also divide their time uh, equally. And if they just deal with these 600 donors, it might not be fair to others. It needs to be transparent and accountability, and uh, we need some oversight. And basically the selection process of those potential donors would uh, probably best sit with uh, the patient who is uh, soliciting. Also, I, I think it's quite important not to condemn patients who engage in public solicitation, which happened in the beginning actually. 
and they lo get lots of criticism. But people are, are desperate and want, we tell them to take the situation under control and find a live donor. So there we have a disconnect. So what are our responsibilities and are in this case is healthcare professionals. Of course, we have to make sure that the organ donation laws are in place to maximize all kinds of donor potential. Uh, we have to remove misconceptions and disincentives for live donors to step forward from any live donation. Uh, obviously in the UK, we're very, very well advanced with the UK live donor kidney sharing scheme um, that gives lots of extra options for desperate people to be transplanted for medical reasons. Um, and we can of course provide information and better information to patients, um, patient tailored education or home-based education um, to everyone involved and specific attention to actually potential donation from unspecified or non-directed altruistic donation. That also, you know, if you specify one uh, recipient, you might actually consider donating to uh, uh, as part of a chain in the kidney sharing scheme uh, where more people can be helped. And actually in the end, also a deceased donor waitlisted patient would benefit. So dealing with public solicitation and respect solicited donors as regular specified live donors, because does it really matter what the relationship is or whether there was a previous relationship and uh, to what grade this relationship was? Does it really matter? Uh, I put out the question there. Um, despite all the practicalities and challenges, we have to, I think, really accept and be grateful that people want to do that. Um, we talked about education and expectation management when considering public solicitation. And I think in the guidelines in the UK, there's already specific attention to, um, uh, to directed altruistic donation and, and some guidance in there for healthcare professionals and a framework which is approved by HDA. So that is really good, but many countries don't have that. I'd like to stop here because I'm looking forward to the other talks and the discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Frank. So, so interesting and lots that you've already touched on that I'm hoping we can pick up um, in the discussion a little bit later on. Um, I'm aware that I um, mistakenly said you can ask questions using the chat button. It's actually the Q&A button. So hopefully you'll all be able to see that. If you can't see it and you're on a tablet or phone, if you tap on your screen, hopefully that will come up for you. Um, and I'm also very conscious we didn't talk about the kidney sharing scheme in the introduction. We've got a whole other seminar on that um, next month if you're interested in finding out a little bit more about how that works and how that's evolved and why it's of such benefit to um, uh, people waiting for a transplant. Um, but lo yeah, lots of, lots of issues there that we'll pick up later and, and come back to. Um, I'm now going to ask uh, Sandy Shoker to join us. Um, Sandy will introduce herself, I'm sure, but um, was uh, worked with um, the family of a young girl called Anaya um, to help run a, a social media campaign to try to find a kidney for Anaya, who was at that point two years old. So Sandy's going to talk about what their experience was and what they learned along the way. So we're hearing it from, from the other side, um, that, that actually that's the, the people who are, are looking for um, a kidney uh, for somebody who's very precious and important. So um, Sandy, I'll hand over to you and thank you for joining us. Thanks everyone, um, please share my screen. Okay, hopefully you can see Anaya there. Speak up if not, okay. Um, brilliant, okay. Well, thanks for inviting me along today. Obviously one year behind schedule as, as Frank said. So um, some of this is coming from the depths of my memory um, because it's been a, a while now. Um, this is Anaya. Um, I mentioned earlier I'm not related to Anaya, but um, I, I think I'm her favourite auntie now. Um, I was one of a, a team, um, a family of friends that supported um, an Amrik and Jyoti, Anaya's parents, in searching for a donor. And on all of my presentations, I say there's emotive content because there were some um, pretty difficult times during Anaya's search. So I'm um, always aware that it's likely to have an impact on on People. But this is Anaya um, when she was less than one year old, and this became the image of her campaign. Okay, so Hope for Anaya was a family led campaign, um, and I was born with ARPKD, um, and her safe arrival was under question. Um, 
Anaya, uh, Anaya's parents were warned that it, it could be that she might not survive birth, but she did. Um, and within weeks, both her kidneys were removed. I think they, um, they were about 1.5 kilos each. Uh, one was removed and, and then the other. Um, and the plan was always that um, Anaya's parents would donate and her father, Amrik, was the, the better of the two matches. But unfortunately, by the time um, Anaya was transplantable, um, due to the number of blood transfusions she'd had, um, that was no longer going to be an option. So the search started for a living donor um, in September 2018. So here's a little timeline of um, Anaya's journey. So she was born in December 2016 and didn't actually come home for the first 10 months of her life. And during that time, she'd had lots of blood transfusions, but she also had a massive stroke. Um, and at that point, um, Amrik and Jyoti um, decided to sign her up as an organ donor in case the worst occurred. But she defied the odds, um, recovered very well and came home in that October. Um, and it was in the August 2018 where um, it, was, it became apparent that neither parent was going to be a match. And so the campaign started really between days because the, ideally they wanted the transplant when and I was um, around two, uh, which was going to be that just four months away. We started the campaign very quickly and there was a huge learning curve, but somehow within 12 months, Anaya received a transplant. So you can see her there on the morning of transplant. And this is a couple of weeks later um, when she's on the road to recovery. Okay. So it was a huge learning curve. Um, what we were told was that Anaya's match um, was going to be best found within the South Asian community, which you may know is a community that doesn't really um, discuss or address the issue of organ donation. Um, and a lot of us on that team, we hadn't really discussed organ donation in our families. It wasn't something that we'd come across, didn't know anybody that needed a transplant and certainly weren't aware of living donation. Um, most of us had signed up to organ donation when we signed up um, for our driving licenses and it was something that just went away then you didn't really talk about it again but we decided that our mission was to really educate um, anybody that we came across about signing up to the organ donor register inform and invite them to sign up as organ donors and then face to face we would then say this is an ayah by the way did you know you could be a living donor um, so that there were two streams to to the work that we were doing was to to boost the organ donor register and then make people aware that they could be living donors so in practical terms um, we built a family network and whatsapp was a very useful tool for this but um, Anaya's parents were very clear, this wasn't just about Anaya. Um, there were a lot of people out there waiting and we wanted to support as many people as possible. And there were some practical steps that we had to take to, to really mobilize ourselves very quickly. And firstly, that was understanding the facts and figures to deliver a message. So lots of online research, lots of information cascading down from Anaya's parents. We created the online platforms and then we started looking at what was already out there that we could piggyback on because this wasn't just a social media campaign. We were out there meeting people at religious events, cultural occasions, um, musical um, concerts um, and sporting uh, events as well. And we also um, took part in lots of interviews um, and that wasn't just a nice parents, just any one of us could, could go out there and, and talk about it. And in mobilising the campaign, it really does help if there's a big friends and family network to support. Um, Amrik um, and Jyoti live in Newcastle, and as you can tell, I'm in Birmingham, but there are lots of contacts up and down the country that were involved. We also engage with professional organisations, NHS Organ Donation, who were great in terms of giving us collateral and information, but also contacts such as Professor Gertrude Dawa and British Seat Nurses, who went out and did interviews and supported on events. The personal events ranged, as I say, from um, Glasgow to Gravesend, so we had quite a wide reach. And because we were focusing on the South Asian community, it was really looking at the regions where um, in those events took place, Birmingham being one, one major centre there. But we also used some of the, the other channels, so that some of the television channels, um, BBC Asian Network, um, presenters such as Sunny and Shay, and local radio stations as well, just really leaving no stone unturned to talk about the need for organ donation and share Anaya's message. And then on, on social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Um, okay. 
And the aim was to reach all generations. So we, we didn't just really target those people that would be the perfect age for to be a living donor for an IA. We spoke to older people who were very receptive to, to the subject um, at times. And, and basically anybody spoke to young children as well to see what their attitude was you know, with their parents to see how they could do it. And here's an example of our schedule that we had of the various events that we ran. Um, using that Punjabi based media and speaking the language helped to gain a wider reach. So we were able to speak in, in the language that would, would help people understand what we were doing and why we were doing it. But it, Frank raised a very important point about the, the beauty contest because who would deny a little baby, a cute little baby, um, and a, a two year old, um, as she was then, um, the chance for, for survival? And there were some practical steps. So there is really a lot to, to learn. Um, we were new to this, but we, we did obviously know that we needed some consistency. So hope for Anaya. Um, Jyoti said that at times the only thing that she had was hope, hope that the right thing would happen for, for her baby. Um, and, look, and learning about what the appropriate hashtags are to, to get those shares and those likes and make sure that the, the posts were picked up in the right place. Because we were so scattered um, and there was a lot to Anaya's story, we created an FAQs so that we could all be informed as to what Anaya's story was and what the need was. And having that central location for information, we all worked full time and running a campaign can be quite intensive. Um, so it can take an hour or two every morning just to keep on top of Twitter, Instagram and Facebook and acknowledge people's comments and likes and encourage them to, to sign up or to, to make an inquiry about living donation. So just being organized did really help. Um, when we approached um, to, to be a, a present at events, we realized not every organization will welcome you. Um, and that wasn't always comfortable to hear, but there were a lot of places that did say yes. And it was impossible to be everywhere, which is why social media was so important. Um, we also learned that the three platforms work very differently. Um, and the audiences are very different as well. So Facebook, you can put visuals and lots of words. Twitter is very restrictive and Instagram is mainly picture. We learned who to connect with. So organizations such as Share Your Wishes and Give a Kidney Yourselves, um, that really did support us. So Give a Kidney was useful so that when we didn't find people that wanted to be living donors, we directed them towards um, the, the website there. And share your wishes was useful because they, they shared the story and also it gave us um, hope because we could see that other people had had found success previously i had a quick look at numbers the other day we know we've lost some followers since because a nice campaign isn't as active now as as it was in its heyday um and there's some duplication there some people are following us on all platforms but there's, there's a reasonable number of followers there okay lessons learned in practical terms there was lots of on the job learning um, about what we needed and but about what we could and couldn't do. And it wasn't as if there was a guide or any guidance or any one place um, to go to, to, to really get that information. So it was an iterative process. Um, and in the first instance, we actually had thousands of leaflets printed with the wrong information. As I mentioned, it can take a lot of time to run a campaign like this, more than we realised. Um, um, there were four people managing the social media accounts at one time, obviously not at the same time, but it helps if you can spread that workload. We tried to make sure the message was concise and consistent so that everybody was clear on what we were asking for. And we did try hard to be responsive because every inquiry was, was gold dust and we needed to make sure that we followed those up. It's very important to be transparent as well. And Frank mentioned transparency. And as a family, it was important because we were asking somebody to donate a kidney. And of course, the first thing people are going to say, well, why can't you? Um, and we did make it clear the reasons why Anai's parents couldn't donate and also that the rest of the family were being tested. Obviously, there was a call to action there. So we wanted people to be clear on what they needed to do. So send an email or make a phone call and these are the people that you needed to contact. Um, and because we wanted to support others in the same boat, we were constantly sharing stories of others that needed um, organ, donor, organ donors, but also stem cells. So there were lots of um, case studies there that we could share and other families running the same campaigns. And this is a big one. I think Frank covered this as well, needing to work with a hospital because we made them aware of what we were doing. 
and we were trying to gain as much information about what we needed to do because we were conscious that every inquiry was going to create work for the hospital so we wanted to reduce the amount that they needed to do so we tried to give as much information as possible and minimize the impact um, and which is why websites such as the Wikimedia were important and NHS VT. So we were constantly sending out those links. In terms of those interactions, what we found was that most people were unaware of um, the need to sign up to the organ donor register or to, to give consent as a, um, or that you could even be a living donor. And those that we did meet, we did meet people that had negative experiences of transplant. So you have to tread carefully there. Not everybody is sympathetic. Um, we needed to keep an arm's length relationship. Obviously, there were ethical considerations, and I don't know if we fully understood those initially. Um, certainly, the wider team didn't, but we, we did quickly learn that once somebody's made an inquiry, it was best really to leave them to it and, and not have too much interaction. Um, and that need for emotional distance was important as well to make sure that when somebody was going to donate, they were doing it for the right reasons. I mentioned there that not everyone is kind. When you're running a, a, a campaign on social media and in person, you'll, you'll encounter people that say things that you don't expect to hear. Um, and we did try and protectionize parents from, from much of this. Um, we didn't want them running up and down the country, although they did at times. The aim was to give them as much time as possible with Anaya, whose health was, was really volatile at times. Um, but they did unfortunately encounter people that weren't sympathetic to the cause. Um, I've mentioned this before, supporting others in the same boat. Um, and we were grateful for, for any support that we got, people that were inviting us along to events, people that were saying yes when we asked them whether we could attend. But that support was critical, the likes, the shares and the prayers. Um, Faith was a big part of a nice campaign. Um, and it, it was nice to hear that everybody was, was keeping her in their hearts. And this is a really important point. The internet doesn't forget. So we needed to be careful that when we receive comments that we were responding in a way that would you know, stand the test of time and, and wouldn't create any, any conflict further down the line. So this was the experience, this was the hard bit. Um, so working really predominantly in the Sikh or Punjabi community, these, this was really useful to have leaflets and an organ donor card which, which showed that it's actually acceptable within our faith. But we did have lots of different comments. Um, so one comment was, why don't you just let her go? So somebody who's quite averse to transplant um, and, and questioned why a, a, do a donor was being sought. Um, somebody who questioned what an I might have done in their past life to deserve such a fate. Uh, challenging views such as religion, um, not being allowed, uh, not permitting organ donation, which it does, um, and it was good to challenge that view. And it was great to hear people that were saying thanks for being here, I meant to sign up, or because of this post I've signed up today, thank you for the link. People saying I'll think about this, great to hear people that had already registered, and then finding people that had had a transplant, or that they themselves had had a transplant. We met somebody who had donated to a loved one, um, but we also met somebody who had gone abroad and paid a lot of money for a kidney. Um, and that was quite hard to hear when you learned about the circumstances of the, um, of the search and the, the outcome there. And this was the outcome. So, um, this is Surinder Sapple tacked with Surinda prior to the transplant. So we, she didn't make, she didn't comment or, or make any uh, approach to us via Facebook or, or email or anything. And we were lucky. I'm, I'm impressed that, and we were told that that was a notably high um, result. And I think there were times where there was a lot of work on, um, for the hospital to do to manage all those inquiries. And Sarinda, um, a few days after the transplant, Sarinda posted these images on Facebook. And as you can imagine, a lot of people picked this up and said, we found your donor. And we were very cautious then. So respecting NHS protocol, um, uh, an eyes mum wrote to Sarinda through the transplant coordinator and initiated those conversations. 
But Anaya's campaign wasn't just straightforward in terms of here sign up to be an organ donor. We wanted to do more than that. So there were lots of different things that we did. We arranged a prayer ceremony one month and then we arranged a five kilometer virtual race, which we had people take part in Malaysia, South Africa, various countries in Europe and, and locally here as well and raise some money for, for kidney research. Um, and we had the act of kindness day as well and all sorts of things were being done then. Uh, we also promoted blood donation. So you can see um, Joe, uh, Jyoti and Amrit donating blood. Um, and we know quite a few people came forward and, and registered as blood donors, which was great. And then we also supported organ donation week. So this is just prior to an eyes transplant. We put posts out every day to to support organ donation we can and spread that message generally and here's some pictures of some events that we attended so we did a, a feed here in Birmingham at one of the soup kitchens the organ donation game which was difficult to secure but was a real success when we ran that in Leicester here's some other events there as well and we managed to get on stage with um, quite a famous singer Gamora Gurawal who um, invited us along to to talk to the audience at um, and a concert and this was the very start of the campaign where we um, had a television interview um, and Jyothi and Amrit travelled from Newcastle to London to take part in that. And this is when the story went public. So the, the mirror picked up the story and there's um, Anaya and her donor meeting for the first time. And then a couple of weeks later, they went on this morning um, and we learned a lot about the parameters of what we could and couldn't say on, on television. So we, we couldn't, for example, mention Hope for Anaya as the name of the campaign but we could tell other aspects of the story. Um, in December, we did the advent calendar of Anaya's journey, again, just focusing on educating people on how Anaya had made it through to transplant so that people understood what the need was for, for donation. And here are some pictures of Anaya post-transplant. So going off to nursery, becoming a big sister, lots of smiles. Um, little one pulled out Anaya's feeding tube the other week. So that was quite, a challenge for, for Jyoti. Um, and since then, we've been promoting other messages. So at the start of the pandemic, we had Anaya hold this poster, which was great because she got quite a few searches. But then when NHS Organ Donation shared it, she had 12,000 likes, which makes her quite successful. Um, and then just to mention one of the aspect of social media was that we, in January 2019, we did a Twitter takeover uh, which was supposed to be two hours, but because it was going well, that was um, powerful, extended it and gave us a, an extra hour. And it was very intense. Uh, we had lots of well wishes and we had a few people sign up as organ donors. And it was good to get that dialogue going around living donation. Um, one person went on to be tested. And here he is. This is Azim. And Azim actually um, went on to be tested for Anaya. He wasn't a match, but then he, he gave his kidney to somebody else which is a great result for for us to know that somebody benefited from from that and there's a picture of us all meeting um up in newcastle as well and one of i know he's watching today actually so um and one of the reasons that he donated i think was because he could walk to the hospital where he needed to be tested so. Other campaigns since then um Rohan, uh, was a 12 year old who um uh, needed a kidney donor and Simran. Simran's campaign was starting this time last year and we were looking at arranging events but um, the pandemic cut that short obviously so Simran's campaign was predominantly on social media um, and through TV channels. Both Rohan and Simran have now received transplants through um, post-life donors. Um, and moving on from this, continuing that journey. So um, thanks to John, who's watching today, we're going to be running a Twitter takeover for Disney and Amber from Barnstable. They are two of triplets um, who need a donor, 15 year old Tishan, Naomi who's in her 40s, and we're still continuing to support the community in general. And I think that's it. Okay. Thank you. Thanks so much, Sandy. It's really, it's so wonderful to see the outcome of, of, of that campaign and and, to, and particularly, you know, that question of actually, you know, Azeem stepping forward to donate to, to her and, and then going on to be a, just a, a non-directed donor. And I think that's one of the, the wonderful outcomes of, 
you know, any campaign to raise awareness of living donation actually, as you've said, kind of encourages people to sign the organ donor register to consider living donation. And it may, you know, increase transplants for other people as well as the intended intended recipients. So, so thank you so much for sharing, sharing all that wonderful work. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, so I'm going to just, hand over to Lisa Burnap now. Lisa um, has, has many hats, not least uh, president of the British Transplantation Society, but she's with us today as clinical lead, UK clinical lead for living donation. Um, and Lisa might just want to pick up on some of those, the points made by Frank um, and Sandy and, and with, a, with a kind of perspective of, if, if this is something you're thinking about, what things might you need to consider? Um, and how to go about it and then and then we'll kind of move on to some discussions some questions coming in already really interesting questions so um lisa over to you thank you jan um and i hope everybody can hear me all right my sound quality isn't great today so i'll trust jan to intervene if if not um so you know thank you to frank and sandy because they've raised so many issues that are really such a pertinent part of the discussion around directed altruistic donation and and I think one of the main things is that actually, you know, our objective is to make sure people get the transport they need at the time they need it. Um, and this forms a part of that. Um, there are some pitfalls, but there are also some huge bonuses, as you've heard from Sandy. Um, and I think part of the learning curve for us is actually trying to identify the kind of information that will be most helpful for people either making an appeal or responding to an appeal. And I think we've learned en route. And it was interesting that when Sandy was talking about when the Hope for an Eye appeal went live, that actually we didn't have this current information now available and, I, and I'm pleased that in fact that many of the things she mentioned are things that we have now included in the information um, that should support people if they're, if they're making an appeal or responding to an appeal like this. And I suppose the key things are, well, first of all, if you, if you are thinking of doing either of those two things. There is information now on the organ donation website. That's the three W's, organdonation.nhs.uk, under the Becoming a Living Donor tab, which is at the top. Um, and if you go into the kidney section and the fact sheets, there are actually fact sheets that you can, um, that, 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 that will identify all the things that you need to think about. I think the most important thing is really involving the hospital team, the living donor coordinator team, because they can guide with the kind of information that perhaps Sandy and, 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 and those working with her found difficult to begin with about how you approach it. The things, the beware things, you know, those internet trolls, unfortunately, who say things that you're really not anticipating when you start out as a, a, a campaign like this, but really important to involve them and actually, I noticed that on Sandy's flyers, that on all of them, they had names of the coordinators. And in consultation with the coordinators, what we have agreed in our information is that individual names are probably best not used, but teams are. And again, it's just because once the information is out there, it's always there, it's in the public domain. And as Sandy said, the internet never forgets really. So, so we sort of advise against using individual names, but the principle first is go to the living donor team, work with them so that actually they know, A, what you're aiming to do. And secondly, so that you have, um, you know, they can anticipate that this will be quite a, an addition to their workload. Um, Sandy identified that they had 35 um, donors offers coming forward for an IA. And actually that's about, that is in fact the experience that people relate around the country. So suddenly if an appeal like this goes out and the living donor coordinators receive 30 or 40 interests, what they want to be able to do is respond appropriately to those people. And, and of course, one of the things is managing the expectation of both the recipient side and for the donor side. So what we've tried to do in the information is to say, if you're putting out an appeal, these are the ways to do it. If you're 
responding to an appeal before you just pick up the phone or respond on an email or whatever you're going to do look at the information on the website because there's a lot of information about what is involved in being a kidney donor and in the early days of these social media appeals what we were seeing is people coming forward and not really having a an idea understandably of what was involved so really important to have that baseline information is this something i could contemplate doing in my life um, and then really understanding that obviously 30 or 40 offers in one go is very difficult for an individual unit to, uh, to work with. So that there will be a system of, of, if you like, selecting the most likely to proceed. Um, I think Frank pointed out in his talk that often people who um, make appeals like this are people who feel that they have been waiting a long time or are likely to wait a long time for a kidney. And so they can be under, the, they can be amongst the most complicated to find a donor for. So the likelihood of finding a donate donor when people come forward, even in that sort of number that we're talking about, is less likely than when you're on the waiting list um, or in the kidney sharing scheme or so on. So um, there is that just to bear in mind when you're responding to appeal, it isn't possible for, a, for hospitals to deal with 30 or 40 um, offers as lovely as they are all in one go. Um, I think one of the really striking things that um, Sandy highlighted and, and also Frank was the, the idea that actually people it's just raising the awareness that with this kind of campaign and the idea that people have that discussion about, well, look, if you were willing to consider doing this for somebody, would you consider doing it for anybody? And, and I think I'd, it would probably behoves me to say that that brings enormous benefit to so many people. Frank's described the kidney sharing scheme. You'll hear more about that in the seminar shortly. Um, and, and really developing those chain reactions and matching um, individuals who spontaneously offer to donate has been really transformational in our living donor program in the UK. And, and so I think having those conversations with people, if you're willing to do it for somebody you've, you've, you've seen um, on an appeal, would you be willing to consider doing it for anybody because everybody has their own, has their own story? Um, so I think I think probably our main objective is to make sure, as I said at the beginning, people get the right transplant at the right tra time for them and how we can do that most effectively. Certainly, this kind of appeal does contribute to that. I, it would only be right to say that actually it is a very a, a, a much smaller chance, a much a, a reduced likelihood of you being um, match to somebody suitable through an appeal like this than through other ways of, 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 of getting the offer of a kidney from a living donor or indeed from a deceased donor. Um, but it is also completely understandable that some people may choose to go down this route and people will respond to this kind of appeal. And that takes another person from the transplant list and another person who's loved by lots of people gives them a kidney. So um, it definitely has its place. I think the important thing that we have learned is that we need to help people to manage that process most effectively and in a way that actually allows the healthcare professionals to work with people wishing to give and receive a kidney in the most effective way so that everybody benefits in the end. Um, so I think, Jan, I'll leave it there and be very happy to open up to questions and discussion as part of the general discussion now. Thank you, Lisa. That's yeah. Thank you for covering covering that off. It's really helpful to hear, um, yeah, how things have changed and uh, the the resources that are now available and have come out of discussions around you know within the transplant community and um, forums at BTS and 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 working with with you know coming across those challenges as as this is as this has evolved. So um, we've got some questions. So uh, what I'll probably do is just try to. Uh, direct them to specific people. I think Lisa, you would the first question that came in was probably aimed at Lisa and Frank about, I think Lisa, you've probably just answered this actually, but the question was around how beneficial is directed altruistic donation in the scheme of things from an NHS perspective? How does it help reduce the waiting list or shouldn't we just be encouraging more people to be non-directed donors and unspecified donors? 
Lisa, I think you've just kind of said actually what, what this does is actually brings people forward who, who might not otherwise um, just step forward as a non-directed donor. People have a particular connection to that particular appeal and then can be that conversation can take place. Um, is there anything more you want to say on that, Lisa or, or Frank? I, I would only say, and I think Frank may wish to add to this, I think there is a balance between um, every transplant is a precious transplant and every person that's transplanted is precious to, I mean, you know, you look at Anar and you can see, you know, the joy that that has brought to her and her family. But I think we do have to be clear that if we were to transplant everybody in this way, it would be an impossible amount of work. So um, it, it, we, there has to be a balance between managing these fantastic offers of living kidney donation against um, the ability to the number of people who can be transplanted through this route. And I, th I think Frank alluded to this, but 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 it is quite a lot of work um, in, a, in a big hit. And so we couldn't do that for every patient. So I think that it has its place. It definitely has its place. It raises awareness. It's really valuable for doing that. We've seen donors spontaneously um, donate when they've come forward for an appeal like this to somebody else. All of that is a good thing to do. But I think it is really important that, that it has its place amongst all the other options available, that we make it make it an option it's one of a, a range of choices but um for the volume of patients we have waiting nearly six thousand patients on the waiting list we couldn't do this for all of those six thousand so we have to be realistic about um managing systems that that create more transplant opportunities for more people alongside this as well yeah if i may add to that and I, I fully agree, Lisa, of course, uh, and we talked a lot about this. Um, I do think we're now mostly talking about these huge uh, public solicitation um, uh, appeals in, in, in terms of finding a donor, but it underpins that more uh, patient guidance is probably useful as to how people can find a living donor um, potentially in in, in smaller networks um, and to support that process, uh, as Lisa also said, the a priori chance or the chance of finding a potential donor through such uh, a big enterprise as Sandy has alluded to. I mean, it's a full-time job nearly for a whole team of people uh, if you do it right. So I guess there is a lot of balance there and my aim would still be is make it, uh, let's, let's talk about it. Let's see how we can support people to talk about it and, and find a living donor kidney in, uh, in their own social networks. Um, and yeah, non-directed altruistic donation obviously uh, helps more people and uh, in the end is, is probably um, an ethically more um, justified way of doing things for many ways. Um, so that's, uh, that's certainly something that, uh, that I would support. Thank you, Frank. I just want to pick up on that because I think one of the really interesting debates and discussions around this has been that um, issue of, I suppose, equity. And um, someone asked a question about distributive justice um, and how we, you know, it, ca it came up in your talk, Frank, about, you know, the, the beauty pageant element, but also, you know, equity of access in terms of you know, do people who have, you know, higher levels of education, are they more able to run? you know, a, a dedicated campaign, are they more likely to have access to bigger social networks, for example? So how, you know, how do, could we, could we talk any more a little bit about how we ensure there's the right balance between equity of access to donation and, you know, and people's absolutely le legitimate right to see, search for a living donor themselves? Do, do you want to comment on that, Frank? Yeah, I mean, um, certainly in my own practice, this is something I, I guess uh, I can talk about uh, freely. You try to help people uh, as much as you can. And you do that for every single person, but you need to find a way that suits that particular person. People who don't um, have any social media or don't even have a computer or an iPhone, um, you know, there's no way that you can help them by, by adv advising them to go on social media. So, and, and other people might actually come to you and say, well, listen, I have 10,000 followers on all kinds of platforms. Would it be useful 
if I would take this, um, uh, I would take my shot there. And then of course you have a very different conversation with these two people. Um, so I guess, yes, it's always like that. People are always different. Some people have, have no one. Some patients I speak to, I talk about living donation, have no one. They live alone, they don't know anyone else. Uh, the only person they see are the people in the shop. And you know, there's so many lonely people around. So how, how dare I even speak, go to your social network. They say, well, doctor, thank you very much, but I have none. So you know, there is already so much inequity and our job is to see how can you then help that particular person? That is my job to act in their best interest. And that's the beauty also from the job because you will find ways uh, for individual patients to, to find solutions. And that's why the, the non-directed or unspecified pathway is so beautiful because it doesn't take into account how much money, uh, how many friends, how many likes on Facebook you have. Um, it's, it becomes part of a national scheme. And in the end, it's allocated by the national competent authority. So that is, in terms of distributive justice, that is the most just way of doing it. Thank you, Frank. Sandy, do you, uh, would you like to have any comment on that, I wonder? I, I, I agree, it, it would be nice. And I, I've seen this on other campaigns where we've, we've tried to appeal for, for, um, um, for individuals to, to find a living donor and that pool just isn't there. And you question, is it because we're not getting to the right people? Is it because of gender or age or, you know, what, what are the circumstances? Starting with the NIAS campaign, you know, we, where we did get lots of interest, even in terms of likes and shares, even if we just look from, from that perspective, we, was, we were initiating a conversation that a lot of people did not want to have. Um, and certainly they made their feelings known, but they, but they thought organ donation was wrong and, I, I, you know, let alone living donation. We had some people that were quite vocal about that as well. But uh, you're right, um, not everybody has that reach and not everybody has a team of people. And there is a financial expense as well, because you're, especially when you're going to events or having literature printed or, or T-shirts or, or images, not, not everybody has access. Um, and certainly I've encountered people that, that need a transplant and have been told that you know if they can find a, a living donor within their network but they don't have the first idea about social media which then puts them in at a disadvantage so they need that support but this is hopefully where non-directed campaigns will help them find find their match i think that's that there's it's a huge learning curve when you when you've got to learn about effectively the marketing side of things which is really what you're you're doing because you're, you're you're trying to get to get the right message to all the right places if you don't have the skills and the ability to do that you're really in the hands of everybody else yeah thank you thank you sandy and i think that that sense of you know there's a question around um you know does uh, yeah what I guess, I guess what, what, what is the impact on the messaging around anonymous donation? It's, I think, a really interesting question. It's aimed at, it's aimed at you, Lisa. I don't know if you, you've seen it, but it's, um, you know, obviously the focus of these campaigns are on the, the needs and challenges for that particular patient that they were campaigning against. And we all absolutely understand, you know, I think any one of us in that situation would want to find a kidney for our loved one. I mean, that, that's a really human thing to do. But um, there was a question about what thoughts do the panel have about what impact these types of campaigns might have on people who are thinking of stepping forward as a non-directed donor because of the kind of, um, I guess, media coverage of these kind of campaigns? Does it almost diminish uh, potentially the, I suppose, the, the drown out the message about anonymous mm -hmm. donation and the importance of anonymous donation, which when, where the kidney goes to the patient who needs it? needs it the most or is put into the sharing scheme and how, you know potentially can help two or three patients it's a really interesting question yeah and I think I think Joan if I just you know a picture speaks a thousand words doesn't it and that's the thing you can say you know I can quote a number like six thousand people on the waiting list waiting for a kidney and I think that's phenomenally huge that still feels far too many to me two thousand people a year you know, there's a deficit of two thousand people a year not getting a kidney transplant they need and yet that, 
you see a picture of somebody who needs a transplant and it evokes a totally different response. And I think this is something that, you know, we, we, if we could create the same response, same Republic response from um, saying there are 6,000 people waiting for a kidney, that would, our job would be done. So, so it, there clearly is a value and, and also there's an awareness issue. I mean, Sandy said this, it's actually, I mean, in the communities with whom you were engaging, um, we don't do that well. We're not doing that well. We're not engaging with people well um, in some communities so that there is a good understanding of the benefits of this kind of transplantation. Um, and, and as Frank said, it's about really the messaging around living donation altogether. We should, we should be saying a lot more about that. Let's talk about it. We've got all the information on the website. We've got films talking about it. They're called Let's Talk About Living Donation. Um, those resources have been produced, as you know, Jan, by by your, you know, people like yourself who have been donors. What do we, what would we want to know if we were coming forward? Um, so I don't think it diminishes it. I think it does help to raise awareness. Um, I think there's a difficult question though about how you bridge that gap between somebody who wants to give to someone they have seen. That is the motive. That is what has motivated them. That person on the screen that they have seen or the leaflet they have seen. And then taking that conversation a step further and saying, well, if you would do it for them, would you just do it for anybody? Because actually there's, there's an Anaya and Anaya's mother and Anaya's father and Anaya's brother and sister out there who are all in equal need. How do we bridge that gap? And, and actually, I can see there's a question further down the chat that addresses the fact, well, you know, it isn't a problem that 30 or 40 people come forward for a single recipient. That isn't a problem, except in managing expectations for that person. Well, if there are 30 people willing to donate, then there's likely to be somebody suitable for me. Actually, that may not be the case. But if we could convert those 30 or 40 people to all donate to the waiting list every time, that wouldn't be a problem at all that would be absolutely fantastic um but we don't get we don't we don't see that same relationship with the number on the waiting list versus the picture in front of you and i think that is a real that is a real marketing challenge as sandy says you know how do we how do we make that conversion frank i know you've got some thoughts about this yeah i mean this is i think it is complementary uh, as lisa was pointing out um, a face, a story at that moment can motivate that particular person that sees that to do that for that person. You see uh, quite often with um, unspecified or non-directed altruistic donors have a, a bit more uh, endogenous or uh, long worked motivations in, in terms of um, why they would like to donate to a person or make, make transportation possible for for lots of people. Um, the motivations, of course, are, are quite often related to personal experiences with chronic illnesses or kidney disease in particular, um, or any other uh, healthcare issue in the past. And you hear most of the people, at least I speak to, and also in, in publications, have thought about it for some time. So I think the, I'm not a psychologist, but perhaps the uh, the driving forces might be the different, the different mechanisms when you see an appeal in front of your face and you say, okay, I'm going to donate to this person, rather than having had several experiences with people being ill and say, I'm going to do this for the greater good. Perhaps we, we basically apply to different types of people, different types of motivations. And therefore, I think they're complementary and the huge benefit of raising awareness, we can't say it enough. Uh, people still don't know that you can live safely with one kidney if you're well screened. So many people don't know this. So many people still think it's dangerous uh, in terms of the operation and, and things like that. And they, if a loved one would donate to them, that they would likely not survive. I mean, this language goes around. So I think the bigger picture of living donation deserves even even more attention for us, for Lisa and Sandy, myself, for you as an organization, it's very difficult perhaps because we feel like we're pumping out information, but is it really um, coming to the place where it needs to be always? Uh, we're, we're biased, we think that we are doing too much, uh, but I, I think it can never be too much. Yeah, it's really interesting, Frank. It's a, it's a challenge for us because I think we, 
Um, obviously, our organisation mostly deals with donors and we don't have those recipient um, uh, stories and case studies on, on our website um, because we're, we're dealing with non-directed donors. But I think as humans, we respond to humans, don't we? we you know, and very clear, I very clearly remember at a BTS Living Donor Forum, some, we, we talked about this subject and a person who had stepped forward to respond to a very specific appeal said, I wouldn't have stepped forward as a non-directed donor. I stepped forward because there was something in that person's story that resonated with me. Um, really interesting comment. Thank you, Azim. Um, Azim, who did step forward for an ISA, said his Transbank coordinator had the conversation about non-directed donation at the very first meeting. So that is happening um, and really, really important that actually if that person stepped forward and can't donate to that person or there's a, be a better suited donor, those people are invited to become non-directed donors. Um, once that link and knowledge is already, uh, awareness has already been raised. So thank you. I think Sandy, you wanted to come in? Uh, just to, to pick up on that, that last point, um, the plan was always um, following uh, an Irish transplant and we, we talked to Sarinda about going back out to all those places where we shared an Irish story and explaining her motivation for being a living donor um, and both her motivation and the experience as well and the health considerations and how she felt afterwards and the health care she's receiving so that people could see actually that it was a very positive impact on her um, you know and and one bonus is obviously she's now part of Anaya's life, but even, even if you're not, in, you know, in the case of Azeem, for example, um, you, um, that was a real missed opportunity. And, and that was really because by the time Anaya was, was well enough to go out and, and you know, be face-to-face be -face for interviews, the pandemic hit. So we, we couldn't really go back out and, and get those interviews in place. Um, and I think it would really help for somebody to stand up, you know, as, as we did in, in the secret products, in the in the festivals, for example, the Asian Women's Festival, that's, that was on the list for last year. For, the, for a living donor to stand up and, and speak either in English or, or in Punjabi and explain, I think that would really help for non-directed um, donations as well, because you don't actually have to focus on that one person, but we can show an image of some of a variety of people for people to identify with. I, I first met Sanjeev um, from Give a Kidney at, at an event where he, he stood up, stood next to me and said, this is my cousin, I've given her my kidney. Um, and then he said, well, actually, she's not my cousin, but I, I don't know her, but I gave my kidney to somebody else that I don't know. And it was interesting that he pulled everybody in by saying that I was a member of his family. And, I, you know, there were lots of ours in the audience at that point because people could relate to you know, giving a, a kidney to a family member. And then he said, well, actually, I don't know Sandy at all, but I gave my kidney to somebody else that I don't know. So I think we could make you more use of that. I, th I think that's a really interesting point, Sandy, because um, for a number of years, we've, we've been running in collaboration with and actually pioneered by the National um, BAME Transplant Alliance, a living transplant initiative, where we've been really trying to engage much more effectively with communities who are more skeptical about living donation or perhaps more concerned about it in the way that Frank has described. Um, and, and that is often sort of a faith-based, not just an ethnicity-based um, issue. Um, and one of the things that, um, that came up is that, you know, would people be more willing to donate to the person a loved one rather than someone they don't know. Uh, and I think that is another step forward. But actually what we've shown through the kidney sharing scheme is that around a quarter of the recipients in that scheme are actually from black, Asian, mixed race, minority ethnic groups um, who would not otherwise have had the offer of a transplant but have benefited because other people have stepped forward and created that chain reaction that Frank discussed. And I think that suddenly became a really important feature of those discussions that actually, if you were to step forward and donate to anybody, somebody in your community, even if they don't have a living donor of their own, because they're on the end of the chain on the waiting list, one of those people that Frank described that has no social network who could donate to them, they may still be the benef beneficiary of a living donor kidney simply because someone else upstream has chosen to donate in that way. And I think that's a really important message to give out as well, that it, you don't have to have a donor from your community necessarily to benefit because of these, the way in which these kidneys are offered now. 
Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Lisa. And and as Lisa said, we will have um, a seminar on the share the kidney sharing schemes. If you want to find out more about how they work and how they've involved, it's Lisa Mumford from who's the uh, lead statistician at NHS Blood and Transplant and is, is wonderful. Um, that's on the 22nd of April. Um, we're just about coming up to time. I think there's probably a couple of questions we can answer quite quickly. So Sandy, if I could bring you in. Um, there was a question about how it's uh, on the chat actually, but how does how do you decide which campaigns to support? Oh, um... I, I do get approached personally now to, to support on individual campaigns and it is quite intensive um, and it's also quite emotionally involved as well because you obviously develop a relationship with whoever you're working with. So what I try and do now is help people in running their own campaigns. Um, so I've, I won't turn anybody away if they need guidance or advice. And um, I've written a little um, document as well, just to give them some pointers on, on what to do and what not to do, um, because there's an awful lot to take in when you're starting something like this. And I think for it to, it, I think it's better if the family themselves can run a campaign themselves. But I've worked with campaigns, not just from the South Asian community um, and over in Canada as well, just trying to, to share the experience really. And I see that as a legacy of an IAS campaign. Thanks, Sandy. Um, and, and Lisa, probably just quite a quick one for you, just about uh, numbers um, and how common it is, if you know off the top of your head, uh, for, you know, uh, how many kind of uh, directed altruistic donations actually do go ahead? Do, do we, you know, compared okay. to non-directed, using the a sense of scale? Using the definition of the social media, the media campaigns, rather than the other one, which is the extended family member who you haven't seen for a long time, a very a relatively small proportion. And if you ask the HTA, I think that they would say um, they would be able to give you the number that they've actually approved, but those cases may not all, all go ahead. But it's a really small, small proportion of the overall number of living donor transplants we do. It's probably under 10%. It, it, I mean, it's really, really tiny. Um, uh, because of all the challenges that we've outlined really. Um, so um, this is why it's important that it has its place and that it's managed appropriately. And the only thing I would just say to Sandy is now we have that information on our website. If there are UK campaigns, if you could direct people towards that, that would be very helpful because that then gives a quite a consistent sort of way of approaching it for the living donor coordinators and, and so on. Um, it, it's just, you know, hopefully helps everybody. But also if anybody finds any gaps, please tell us because we're, we're very open to changing things. If it doesn't work, this is an approach. We'll try it. It's better than we've had before. Thank you. Well, that seems like we're pretty much at time. So that seems like a good note to, to finish on. But um, as always, just want to say thank you to, well, to Frank, to Sandy and to Lisa. I think really interesting subject, ethically challenging, morally challenging, um, and really important that we talk about this um, and great to hear the impact of campaigns that have been successful in finding people who would not otherwise have had a donor potentially. So so really important. So thank you all for giving up your Saturday mornings. And um, for the rest of you, thank you for joining us. I hope you found it interesting. If you have got any questions that we haven't, I think there's a couple of questions that we haven't quite got to, if they feel really pressing and you want to email them in to give a kidney, in, in, info at giveakidney.org, we will try and get answers to you um, beyond, beyond today, um, if, if you'd like us to. Um, we'll, send, uh, we'll send a link out probably to everyone uh, to those resources so you have them um, so you don't have to go searching for them um, and also some information about our next uh, webinar which is on the 22nd of April about the sharing schemes so thank you very much everybody um, and hope to see you again.